So looks like we're on. It's Tuesday at 7. What's the date today again? Hey, it's December the 17th, 2019. 2019. We're just before Christmas, but we're not talking about Christmas. I don't oh, think. No. Maybe the conversation will go there. But uh, Spooky. Yeah, we're here to talk with Rex B. Hamilton. But before we get into the conversation, we're just going to kind of patter for a few minutes because people sign on. And as you're signing on... Um, Welcome. Yeah. You guys get the gift of hearing Rex's journey, and <laughs> his journey is that we're going to be talking about is it's going to probably be more than just hunting, but the the hunting has been going on for decades. What was your first year? Nineteen seventy four. We're, we're we're going to get back to that nineteen seventy four. Nineteen seventy four. Yeah. So you guys know that as you share this out to your to your friends list, and. You share it out to particular people if you'd like to. Maybe share it out to a hunt group or a, an effects makeup group. There's going to be a long history of hunting that we're going to be talking about tonight. And remember, this is interactive. So as you sign on, Beth right now is behind the camera and she's sharing out to some groups. But as you sign on and you hear a question or hear a comment and you want to ask Rex a question, if you're live, we can answer it, and if it, if your question comes in later, we often can get back in and answer that later, but uh, we're hoping you guys join us live. And as folks, uh, folks sign on, if you were, do you guys have a chance to watch the Kringle last week? That thing is, was pretty amazing. We gave away a four-pack to the Kringle Experience at uh, Tower City in downtown Cleveland. And we also, this past week, on The Mummy and the Monkey, they showed The Dead Matter. The cool part about that was Midnight Syndicate, Ed Douglas, who is a... Oh, ah, look there at we that. go. Repping. There you go. Yeah, yeah. so um, Ed Douglas was somebody we interviewed in October, and we also interviewed The Mummy and the Monkey, both James and Janet. Say hi to Drew Badger and hi, Drew. Dave Duarte. Hey, Dave. Kyle Dickman, Candy Tolbert. Kyle, Kyle Candy, how are you guys doing? We're glad you're signing on. Mm -hmm. Remember, ask us questions uh, along the way. We're, this is going to be just a really interactive uh, <coughs> session here as we talk uh, talk with Rex. But this past Friday, we we had a coming together of two Tuesday at seven interviews. Uh, the Mummy and the Monkey, Janet and James, showed the Dead Matter on on the their Friday horror host show and it was it was a great uh, great episode. But as we're as we're signing on here, I think we're after 7, right? 702. 702. So share out please. Um I don't know what we'll give away. Maybe you know what we'll do is uh because Rex is advertising Midnight Syndicate, we'll give a Midnight Syndicate uh CD out next week for everybody who shares we'll dr we'll drop you into a a drawing and we'll pick a name next week and we'll set, send off a Midnight Syndicate CD. I don't think we have Christmas. I think it was already gone, but we'll find one to, to give away next week. So share off and we'll we'll draw names. We drew Eileen Barlock's name on Friday. No, it was Thursday. Yep. On Thursday. So we had a short week for the sharing, but thank you if you were one who shared that Kringle interview. So, all right, enough patter. I think people are probably signing on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I usually start by asking a question. I want to call it unexpected because sometimes they're unexpected questions, but this might be unexpected. <laughs> and so Rex B. Hamilton, um, if you were to be nominated for a, like a Guinness World Record, what world record would you hold? I think I'd hold two of them. I think I'd hold, here's the guy that's acted for more years in commercial haunted attractions than anybody else on the planet. And then here's the guy that's acted in more commercial haunted attractions than anybody else on the planet. So go ahead and nominate me. I, you know, I, I have an ego the size of North Dakota. I'm fine with, you know, more awards. Yeah, so... No, no so problem. The, the largest number 
and probably the longest running, right? Mm -hmm. I would those say are your, so. Those are your two. That, that, as far as I know, and I've met a lot of people in this business, of course. You have too. Yeah. But I've never met anybody that's close to me with, uh, with either one of those numbers. So for those of you who are <laughs> signing on, when we talk about the longest running. Yeah, let's, I, let's, yeah. He, let's hear from the viewers. Yeah, so, so the, the longest running, if you guys uh, kind of throw in, it'd be interesting if you happen to be working in a haunted attraction or have worked, if you'll just throw out the, the year that you started. Um, if you're older, if you started prior to 1974, and then we might have to uh, remove Rex from the longest uh, you, you running might have haunted, to. haunted actor. Um, you might, but haunted houses themselves didn't really come around and, and you know, become what, they, what we know them to be until 1970. So there's not a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, not a lot of slack there between 1974 and 1970. We, we may have we may have to figure out a way to get you in the Guinness Book of World Records because Yay. I think I, we just have to submit it. I'm you like, have to submit it, and because you, and uh, you're a, a master of records, I mean, you have stuff. You're like, oh yeah, here's where I worked, and here's my history, and I have photographs probably of every single haunted house that I've ever worked in. So oh, I, I, too, probably the the largest photograph collection of actors. <laughs> There's number three. Could be, could be. All right, so. I'm going to get into the, the haunting here in just a moment, starting in 1974. But before we go there, your I ask this question often, and that is if people reflect back, at what point in your life, and, uh, and just throw out kind of free flow, at what point in your life did you know that you were creative or theatrical or destined to be kind of moved in this direction? Well, I, uh, I had a lot of theatrical experience long before getting into the haunted house business. Okay. I had done theater for almost a decade. I had done uh, right around 60 odd shows. Now, I should clarify that and say most of those shows I had an acting part in, some of them I did lighting, some I did stage managing, some I did sound effects mm -hmm. in, some I did scenery construction and so on and so forth. But I had nearly a decade of that before ever setting foot inside of a haunted attraction. So like it's, it, you were acting in the 60s? Yes, yes. In, in uh, kind of conventional theaters? In, in high school and college, yes, exactly. Churches, community theaters, sure. So what happened? In other words, so you, so you, so you go from conventional acting yeah, and... We'll, we'll call it legitimate theater. That's what everybody calls <laughs> legitimate it. Legitimate theater. Yeah, whether it's a musical or if it's a, you know, I like stage managed talent shows for... For different groups or you know community theaters I did lighting for them I actually got to this is bragging so you know everybody you know, whoop, 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 you know watch your ego meter there at home but there came a point uh, and this is just before I got in the haunted house business where I was getting a reputation around the greater Cleveland area as what's known as a show doctor well a show doctor is somebody who knows a lot about um, various aspects of putting on theater and gets pulled in when the director or the producer or whatever notices that this show is in real trouble. And so that happened to me a couple of times. I get this phone call saying, hey, Rex, we got two weeks to go. Seriously, this is how I met Maureen, my, my wife, okay? Hey, we got this show here, this thing's in real trouble. We need somebody to come in here and supervise the construction. We need somebody to take a bit part or two. We need somebody to stage manage and do all of that stuff at the same time. So that's what I mean by, by a show doctor. Yeah. And I was really happy with that, okay? Because I had started out in acting in the mid-60s and enjoyed that, but as time went by, got more and more into the technical portion of it, especially lighting and sound and special effects. Because with acting, you're stuck by the script. Now, you and I and Beth, we're, we're not stuck with scripts anymore, being right. in the haunted house business. We come up with our own scripts all the darn time. Yeah. But on stage, you're stuck with the script, and if you say to yourself, gee, I wish I was a bigger star than that, or you know, I wish I could you know, let loose, or I wish I could, no, you can't. You gotta stick with the script you know, all the time. There's, there's gotta be some questions and some curiosities. <laughs> this is, Haunt, this is Rex pre-haunt. 
Right. So if you have any questions, you've got a short window to, to, to ask those. I suppose we could always come back to them. We have a short window to ask. So 10 years, did a little bit of everything. You earned the reputation of show doctor. What Begin, are, beginning to, yes. Beginning to. So beginning to, right. What, uh, what were some of those maybe memorable roles, things? I mean, so you met Maureen. Yeah, I, I, actually, right? I actually was the show doctor on this particular show at Chagrin Valley Little Theater, which is in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, which is in Cuyahoga County, the same county as Cleveland I was in. And that's where I first met Maureen way back in December of 1973. <clears throat> and what was we, the show? It was really? called, it was called, it was a big uh, Broadway hit called Bells Are Ringing. And I'll never forget. Happy clap. Mm -hmm. Happy I clap. Like, I like that. <laughs> and 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 despite my best efforts, you know, we got the show on, and you know, the productions went on, and the audience kind of seemed to like it. I will never forget, and I've got the the newspaper article at home and so forth. But the uh, the Sun newspapers went and reviewed the thing, and the headline says, "Bells," meaning abbreviating the, the name of the uh, of the musical bells clangs and clatters oh no at cvlt Green valley little theater bells clangs and clatters at cvlt <laughs> uh-oh you couldn't save that one <laughs> I, I i will tell you and the people who know rex are amazed at his uh elephant like memory you like you remember these things like I mean, that's not anything that I pull out. That was from 1973, and you remember a Sun newspaper headline? Well, theater was my life, okay? Yeah. But, you know, my, my regular job, I was working for a bank at the time, okay? And I was just a, I was a management trainee, or I had just gotten hired. I got hired on uh, on December the 3rd, 1973, and, and the, the show went in production like about two weeks later or something Oof. like that. So I was a flunky teller at the time is what I was. Just you know, learning the banking business. Mm -hmm. I was a stupid flunking teller. Flunky. I said flunking. I meant to say to flunky say. teller. <laughs> Fortunately I missed the, the word we didn't want to have on there. Okay. Now now were you a hippie? Were you like in the seventies? Were you describe yourself in the seventies because I'm I'm hearing Professional Professional and theater you're get, gaining reputation as a show doctor, and and you're moving around all over town. Yeah, but I'm right? only 23 years old at that point. Yeah. I'm not very old, so. And and that was shortly after the Vietnam War too. Well, the Vietnam War is still going on. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that won't be mm -hmm. over in, for another two years, and not until '75 at least. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so what a what a. So as we're kind of date stamping, what Watergate. was it like? Watergate. Yeah. We're in the middle of Watergate, dude. We're, you know, everybody's looking at the newspaper every day, going, you know, what's the next article we're going to see that's that's, uh, you know, brought in from the Washington Post by by Woodward and Bernstein. You know, what next? Impeachment. Okay. Yeah, impeachment. Impeachment would be the following August in '74. Mm -hmm. And what were you listening to at the time? Oh, nothing but WMMS. Okay. Nothing but. I mean, it was classic rock then. Okay. Rolling Stones. Of course, the Beatles had broken up by then, but. Led Zeppelin, man, okay. <laughs> you know that kind of classic stuff. That's a, that's a blast. That's a blast from the past. It is. So Karen Murphy says, "Sexy Rexy." Oh my gosh! She's Hi, Karen. watching. Bob Turner is watching. Hi, Bob. Alan Wolbser. Oh um, our neighbor Ron. Hey, Ron. Um, Frank Lipscomb. Beast. Frank Beast. Yep, Beastie yeah. is watching, and he started, he thinks he started in 1996. House is watching. Hey, hey House. G-Man. Duarte says he thinks he started uh, 88. There you go. Okay. Uh, la, 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 la. Nobody pre-74 yet? No, I don't think we're going to have any pre-74. But at least he was there with the old house, okay? Yes. Because 88 was the final year for the old house at Love You, so. That's and true. House, and House, in he's you've got a when did house start are I, you on there dave uh, I, I met him in 87 so i know he was um he was at the old house you know, yeah yeah he definitely was at the old house but I, got, I don't know when he started i got photos of, i think he was 15 that year he's a baby 
It's just oh, a, little, I'm a little toddler. <laughs> All right, for those of you who are sharing, we're going to be giving a Midnight Syndicate CD away next week, and it's because Rex is billboarding Midnight Syndicate. And we're going to ask you a little bit about that. In a, in Good, because i got a great Midnight Syndicate story got for you. a great story? Mm -hmm. Sure. Great. So, okay, so we're going to we're gonna flash back, and so you're, you've got this... 10 year decade and you're gaining some great reputation as a cleveland theatrical right this is a legitimate theater right legitimate theater and right. then what happens so, so what happens so what happens is i wind up getting to the pinnacle of everything i've been pushing for in the theatrical world is you want to get your own theater so you can put on your own plays and you can produce your own plays the way that you want to put them on mm -hmm. okay and this longtime friend of me a friend of mine who was actually uh, at my father's age, and I kind of paired up uh, a few years before that. His name is Charlie Bourne. He was an engineer for Teledyne. He was an electrical engineer. And he was a good director and a good actor. He's a dancer as well. And and so was his, his daughter. And, and so we went looking all over Cleveland for theaters. I could tell you all the different buildings. We went to the flats. We went to the warehouse district. This is back in the late 60s and early 70s. And we're looking for a building that we can go rent. Well, lo and behold, we come across the old Peninsula Playhouse, which is in the village of Peninsula, which is in Summit County. Peninsula is about halfway between Cleveland and Akron. And we're able to get it. It's got a th it's got a theater in there. It's got a stage. It's got 152 seats in it. it, it it's got a raked, you know, auditorium inside of it. It's got everything that you need because it had been a playhouse before, but it had been abandoned. So Charlie and myself took the thing on, and we we uh, produced two different plays during the summer of 1974. We put on a, a, a farce called No Sex, Please, We're British, which is just a howl. <laughs> and then we put on this kind of esoteric, uh, kind of black comedy uh, written by Kurt Vonnegut from Slaughterhouse-Five and, and so forth. And the name of that play is Happy Birthday, Wanda June. And so we're about, we're, we're in August, I guess, like mid-August of 1974. And, and we were just about ready to get done with the, to finish with the rehearsals for the, for the second show that we were doing. And two of the actors came up to me and said, Rex, how about if we put on a haunted house? And I looked at them and I said, what is a haunted house? And they said, well, just like Hudson. Well, they lived down in that area. This is about 30, about a 30, you know, mile drive or something like that yeah. from down to, or, close to downtown Cleveland where I live. They said, well, it's just like Hudson. So Hudson is the next community over from the village of Richfield. They're both on the same street on Route 303. And in 1972, the Hudson JCs had opened one of the first haunted attractions in the greater Cleveland area. There were three that, that opened that year, and those were the first three in Cleveland. Hudson JCs, Parma JCs in the city of Parma. And the other one was Cleveland J.C.'s mm -hmm. in the village of Warrensville Township. And of course, I had never heard of, of a haunted house before, but that's how I got into a haunted And I said, okay, let's try it. What, you know? And they said, oh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be in charge, and, and we will put up the money for it. And, I said, and, we, and they said to me, we just need you for the technical support. I said, okay, sure, I can do that. And that's how I got in my foot in the door in the haunted houses. It didn't quite work out that way, but that was the the initial premise. So you went from show doctor to witch doctor yeah. in, in, in a month, right? <laughs> I had no idea. That's yeah. I didn't know that that was how you got started. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty crazy story. Mm -hmm. it, it, I got invited into it. Uh, I I think uh, Roger, you and 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 Beth, and myself, you. You know, people nowadays, they, they know about haunted houses because they've been around for so long. And they see, and if you're of age, you've seen the radio and TV and newspaper commercials. And nowadays you see it on social media and, and, and websites and so forth. So everybody knows about it, but not back then. It was only newspapers. They couldn't, any, they couldn't afford uh, um, television ads. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. you have any idea how much it costs to go through that haunted house? It was either a dollar or a dollar fifty. Wow. 
I mean, I've got the ads at home, so we could go look. We could go look them up and and see how close I am. But it's it's going to be no more than a buck fifty, buck so, fifty yeah. tops. And that was where was that at? Was that the Cleveland? So where was that location of that haunt? Well, I'm talking about the very first, the very haunt, first haunt, yeah. right? Peninsula Haunted House. Oh, it was is what we called it. Oh. In the village of Peninsula. It was there. Yes, on Route 303. Oh. About two miles east of downtown Peninsula, which of course is down in the deep valley where the Cuyahoga River goes through and the Cuyahoga Valley, you know, railroad and so forth goes through. Mm -hmm. So you were you were called in. Did you manage that show? Was it like you brought in the actors, or were what was your role? My role, and I, I was not the producer, I wasn't the director, it was these two actors that we had for our Summerstock uh, productions. They got the idea of doing a haunted house and they came to us and said, hey, we want to do a haunted house and, and we will take care of producing the whole thing and we will front the money for all of it as well. You don't have to do anything. As I said, they looked at me and they said, Rex, we need you for your technical abilities, so lighting, sound, any kind of special effects. Of course, there weren't much in the way of special effects in 1974. Ain't no computers back then. Yeah. How, did it, how yeah. did it do? How was that first? Uh, it was a loss, okay? <laughs> As many haunted attractions were. It was, mm -hmm. it was a loss. Fortunately, it didn't affect me because I had no investment into it, okay? Your card says, and I took a close-up. And I posted it to the Tuesday at 7. I got, I got some with me in case you need one. Yeah, so, and, uh, but you think those everywhere. And, and Bethany, I was like, I can't get a picture of Rex's car. And she says, it's, there's one in the bathroom up on the thing. And I went right <laughs> in there and there it was. But it says, Terror is my biz, Haunted House actor, right? Correct. Rex B. Hamilton. The B stands for? Baker. Baker. Why do you, why do you go by Rex B. Hamilton? Uh, another long story. Uh, I, I go to open up my first bank account. I'm in seventh grade, and I get asked by the bank manager, uh, how do you want your name to show? And I've all, I'd always signed it Rex Hamilton. My mother, whose main name was Baker, that's where the Baker comes from, she always signed her name Nancy B. Hamilton. And I thought, you know, the, having that middle initial in there, and my father always did Perry Elwood Hamilton, Perry E. Hamilton. So for my parents both use their middle initial, I'll use it too. So that's where it started, was seventh grade at Shaker's Savings in Pepper Pike, Ohio, nice. opening up a, a savings account. Mm -hmm. okay? And that was long before Google search, because right now <laughs> you, can just, you can just Google search Rex B. Hamilton and it pulls you up. Right. And mm -hmm. that's, so it's it's an identifier now, which... And especially if, if you add a couple of qualifying words after it, because I, I used to write a lot of essays about the haunted attraction business. So the titles of the F essays would be something like, Rex B. Hamilton uh, looks forward to meeting you at Transworld. Rex B. Hamilton reports. If you put in the word reports after my name, that'll help Google. It'll drag up some of those uh, uh, those essays that I've written over the years. Yeah, you write pretty well. Where did, where did that come from? Well, I have a degree in English, oh. so... <laughs> So, I guess I did. I know that. You yeah, that. you knew that. Yeah, you I knew that. that. You knew that. Even though I'm in the, I've been in the computer business all my life. I have no training for the computer business, but I can write and I can speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you done voiceovers? Because you got quite the voice. I've done a few voiceovers, and now that I'm retired, I'm looking forward to really giving that a shot. Yes. So you guys out there in Tuesday at Seven Land. Yeah. You what? got a voice. Mm -hmm. If you need a voice. If you need a voiceover. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's say hi to Bo's Rab. Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Boy, I haven't seen Dan in a while. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, congratulations are in order. I know you're a... Uh, uh, entered into the Hall of Fame. So oh, congratulations, Dan. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, congratulations, Dan. Congratulations. That's awesome, mm -hmm. and thank you for joining us. And again, for those who are joining, if you share... We'll put you in a drawing for a Midnight Syndicate CD, and you are free to jump in and ask questions because we want this to be interactive, an uh, interactive conversation with uh, the folks that are watching. All right. So, maybe, 10 years. Yeah. Maybe, I was going to say, maybe reiterate, this is Rex, and if anybody's jumping in oh, and out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like they do on radio things. You're yeah. listening to Rex B. Hamilton. Exactly. Rex B. Hamilton. And Roger Miller. <laughs> B stands for Baker, which we just learned. <laughs> but uh, we were, Rex is, 
we started off with probably realizing that he would hold at least two Guinness Book of World Records. I would um, think maybe so. more. I maybe think more. Only two that only I know. Two? Only two. Being the longest tenured actor, as well as acting in the, the most commercial haunted houses. Commercial right? haunted attractions, mm-hmm. yes. Uh huh. So I think we're going to try to get that done because we yeah. deserve that. 45 years, 107 haunted attractions. Wow. wow. And, when you, and when I say haunted attraction, I mean the attraction because sometimes a haunted attraction, they just got one house, maybe they got three houses, maybe they've got a hayride, and they've got a corn maze, and then they've got this. I count those things just as one. Even though they might have three yeah. attractions, is it your... Yeah, the, the, the most that I ever went to was one year at Nightmare in Painesville, which is in Painesville, Ohio, that's in <coughs> Lake County, which is just to the east of, of the county. That How many did they in. have there? They had eight that eight? year, is what they called them. So you only counted that as one. I only count that as one. Uh-huh. Okay. Go by tax ID number. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, they were, they were in a race at the time. Now, you, you probably have heard of the Seven Floors of Hell mm-hmm. out there at the Berea Fairgrounds with, with Rodney Nightscream and so forth. And they were, the producer out there at Painesville, he was trying to one-up them by saying, well, they might got seven out there, but we got eight, boy. We got eight. That's a great story. That's um, a true story. <clears throat> okay, so we've been talking about Rex was acting in legitimate theater for 10 years, had about. earned the reputation as a show doctor. Uh, towards the end, he, you were invited to participate in the show in 1974 in a peninsula haunted house. And uh, so that's where we left off. So, so take us from there. I mean, uh, fill in the gap. Tell us a little bit about your experience as in, because you acted in that show. Is that right? Or were you just producing? Uh, I, did, Jesse, I, did, I did a lot of technical stuff okay. in that. And I also did a zone leader type of thing. Now, zone leader is a term that Roger and Beth and I are used to hear, and maybe you've heard it as well, where a haunted attraction will get broken up into sections of maybe six or eight or ten scenes, and then there will be some sort of a supervisor for that particular area. Well, I was a zone leader for the second floor mm-hmm. of, the, of the Peninsula Haunted House. I really didn't get out and act in front of people, but I did a lot of voiceover behind the scenes. Follow the green light or do this or do that, you know, and and so forth. As well as operating what's known as a crash bag. Uh, They were looking for uh, effects. So having only been in theater and with, of course, no computers around or no animatronics or anything like that, I thought, okay, what's loud and, and crazy that we could do here? And so I used this old gag that, that's from, a, from theater that's called a crash bag, which is literally a, a big, heavy-duty canvas bag that's filled with broken glass and bottles and cans and metallic stuff that you drop onto a hard surface for a real loud bang. And what we did is we set up this chute, maybe about two feet square, made out of wood. Customers would walk down the hallway, and of course they couldn't see that Right on the other side of this this wall right here was this two by two chute with this bag hanging up in the rafters of the uh, you know the theater where you're actually on the stage of the theater is, is the section where we were in and I also rigged up a light up there and the light was was really low tech it was just a circular old fashioned circular uh, light shape maybe about two feet in diameter and something like that with like a 40, 40 watt bulb. Uh, kind of scotch taped into it yeah just using lamp cord zip cord 18 gauge you know that real thin brown stuff that you see in your uh, in all your lights and so we rigged it up so that uh the light would turn on fall down maybe six or eight feet and so forth the light switch would go off the crash bag would get would uh get let loose and the crash bag would go pow, pow, right next to people. Now, of course, they're separated by a wall, wall. here. So there's no way that anybody's going to get hurt, okay? And also this light that we had, the thing weighed maybe about six or eight ounces altogether. And we had an extra uh, uh, piece of uh, wire on it. So just in case the electrical cable broke or anything like that, we always wire up stage lights. If you ever go up backstage and see all these lights that are hanging on these poles, if you look, every one of them's got a chain on it with a lock. 
as well as the, the big mm -hmm. huge C clamps that, that hold those things in place. Because every once in a while those C clamps work themselves loose for whatever reason. Right. You don't want a 20 pound light made out of heavy light coming down and killing somebody. Yep. So we did the same thing with this little six or eight ounce light. We never had any problems with it. And it was a great effect, mm. but that's the only thing I knew how to do. <laughs> <laughs> I remember because I was, I, I didn't go to that hunt, but I had, I was going to. You probably weren't even Hudson born yet. <laughs> Uh, I was going to Hudson and Parma in 1972, 73. Okay. I think Hudson, right? When, when did they start? They all they all started the same year. Which Kindergarten was, or first grade, and which would have been 72, 73 for me. All three of those J.C. Haunted Houses began the first uh, the same year, which was 1972. What, uh, in, I think I mentioned, I think I mentioned this to you not too long ago. I was like, I you know what Haunted Houses need again? It kind of strangely, but I think it's ironic. It was actually a uh, a return because I remember gorillas. They all had these gorillas in the hunts, and they would have like bars, and then they would and have the, like rubber hose, right? Right, the stretchy bars. <laughs> yeah, and they come right out in the hallway right and they chase you down. I mean, that I wasn't. I do remember uh, you saying that. That yeah, was it. Too long after yeah. King Kong and all those black and whites, and you watch them on Thursday uh, and Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and so maybe they were praying or playing upon the fears of giant uh, giant gorillas, but mm -hmm. that's uh, that's the I remember from those early haunts. Um, okay, so 74, what happens next? What happens next is I said to myself, you know, this haunted house business, I don't know about this. I'm not really sure if this is if this is for me. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, kind of spooky. No, it's not spooky <laughs> at all. It, you know, it lost money. Yeah. You know, the, the people that put the haunted house on, they got angry at one another. It was not a happy situation. Um, and um, and it snowed every other night, okay? <laughs> now, you need to know a little bit about uh, <clears throat> the lay of the land here in the greater Cleveland area. The peninsula is pretty high up as far as elevation goes. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to snow any place in the month of October, it's going to snow in a place like that. And it just seemed to snow like every other evening. So it was cold, okay? Yeah. We did get Big Chuck and Houlihan there one evening for oh, a yes. meet and greet. I didn't get to meet them because I was I was back there backstage getting ready and, and doing all the prep work and helping people with makeup mm -hmm. and this, that, and the other and so forth. But we did get Big Chuck and Houlihan to come out and sign autographs. Uh, one evening, I think they were there for an hour, hour and a half, or something like that. That's cool. So that was nice. I I have uh, <coughs> a little bit off topic, but I have uh, in the '80s I saw the ghoul uh, at Hudson Haunted House. Did he you? had his one uh, one eye, and and he signed a thing. And he said, "Ichabod get bent." Yeah, that's it was right. 1980 something. It was, it was sunglasses. Sunglass only, only, only one lens. <coughs> only one lens in the sunglasses, right? Yeah. So, uh -huh. uh, in terms of the horror hosts, mm -hmm. and uh, and now probably the mummy, the monkey will be watching this and reflect back to our connections to old TV mm -hmm. horror hosts as well. So. Haunted House is really out for you. And you were yeah, like, yeah, I'm like, like, oh, about done, right? Done with that. And it's <laughs> like, I'm going to go back to theater. But here it is. It's, you know, it's after uh, Halloween in 1974. It's, it's rapidly approaching 1975. I had never finished my college degree. And it's like, I finally now have a good job with, with this bank that I'm working for. And I got benefits. And I've moved out on my own. I got my own place. And it's like, okay, Rex. It's time to go back to college and finish your degree. So when uh, just a couple months later, in January of 1975, I enrolled at Cleveland State University, and I spent the next four years going to school at nights and also in the summertime um, to complete my degree. And I thought, okay, I can, you know, I've done the theater. The theater was fine. I've done, I did a haunted house. I don't need to do any haunted houses anymore. <laughs> okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Then I got promoted. Now I'm a bank manager. I got this bank manager job and in a different county than, than where I live. So I'm driving all the way out to Geauga County every day. And then I'm driving all the way back downtown in the evening to go to Cleveland State. And it's like, I got enough on my plate right there. Okay. So 
Uh, as you might expect, there was I did not have much of a social life back then, but I was bound and determined to get my gosh darn college degree. Yeah. I wanted to get that done. Okay. And and uh, and so that worked out okay for yeah. for about a year and a half. <laughs> And then I met this girl, okay? <laughs> you probably heard this story before. And then I met this girl. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a girl, and well, I met this guy. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, I could, I should do this and I should do that. <coughs> so I met this girl. And the long and the short of it is, is that her brother was vice president of the Cleveland JCs of all things. And of course, you know, talking and, and being around her and so forth. Uh, and she was a theatrical person as well, okay? Um, uh, she'd done a lot of theater in college. I think she might have even gotten her college degree in theater, if, if I remember correctly. And when I mentioned the, the tale of the haunted house and so forth, and she said, oh, my brother works for the JCs. They put on this haunted house every year. They get tons of people that come in for this haunted house. You should come down there and you should be in it. Well, there was my reintroduction in the haunted house business, and and that was the truth. I mean, the Cleveland JCs haunted house. This place rocked. This place rocked. People were lined up outside for an hour waiting to get in. Even in the rain, they were standing outside with no covered waiting area. They're outside waiting to get in because we tore that place to smithereens, not literally, but but you know, spooky for spookiness wise. Okay. And so I've been in it ever since, okay? So I met this woman, as I said. I met this girl. The girl will do it. And she I introduced you to a whole new perspective. Mm -hmm. It's like, holy moly, okay? Now, were you <laughs> acting or were you also doing tech? It was nothing but acting. acting. Oh, okay. Nothing but acting. And I went in there and tore that place. I got best actor of the, of the year. Of course you did. I got best room of the year. I still have the awards at home I can show you. Oh, yeah. I tore that place to smithereens. <laughs> I was a wild man inside of there. I was an absolute wild man. Um, so how old were you? Uh, in 1976, I was 26 years old. 26 years old. So you're in your 20s, and you're assigned to a single room for the entire season, and the same act actor? I started out in the Frankenstein room. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And my role in there was to get picked up, because we had this huge guy playing Frankenstein, and thrown into this closet. Okay, every time a group came through, well, what most people didn't see is where there's this big, big mattress inside this closet with box springs behind it so you could go flying into this thing, you know, full tilt without getting hurt. And I can't remember how many evenings I did that. It was probably only an evening or two. And I said, man, I don't want to be, I don't want to be second fiddle. I don't want to be a star. And right next to the Frankenstein scene was a scene called a guillotine scene. Mm -hmm. And you can go talk to Ed McKenna and to um, Ed Cashman because I worked with those two guys that year in that scene. So they can back me the up. Guillotine. They can back me up, you know. You were there. You were there. Yeah. You can back me up. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And went in there and then I just cut loose. So just, you were in the guillotine scene I was for in the, the rest of the year? Scene. Yeah, for the rest of the scene. The, uh, the three of us. Uh, Ed Cashman, Ed McKenna, and myself were in there. And we just tore that place oh, to pieces. I love it. Oh, yeah. What role did you play? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I was a screaming maniac inside there that had a half of a, of a mannequin, the, the lower half of the mannequin. And I would pick up the, so, you know, from, from waist down to feet, and I'd pick the thing up around the calves or the ankles and wham, <laughs> mash this thing against the wall just above where the customers were walking through. So it was just over their heads. I was a, I was a crazy person. I was a Love maniac. Yeah. And um, at that time, the design of haunted attractions was that, uh, especially in a, in a building like this, where there were no secret passageways or, or anything like that, you actually had to build railings inside the room to guide the customers. Okay, here's where the customers walk through. <coughs> Excuse me, and on the other side of the railing, Okay, here's the performance area and so forth. So I went flying into these railings, just full speed. Didn't feel a damn thing. I could, you know, I look at myself coming out of the shower every day going, where the hell are these giant purple bruises and so forth? Right here where your hip bones are, because this is where you, 
you'd strike it and so forth. Never felt it going into the, never felt it. I was just, a, I was enraged, okay? Wow. It, it was like I was on a major dose of PCP or something like that. I was a cuckoo person. Yeah. Shrieking all the time. Just shrieking. At the how many time. how many hours was that running? <coughs> was it about four? Was it like it was eight a, to twelve? It was a four hour. Um, my recollection is it was a seven to eleven. Gotcha. How many people would you say you that that went through there in a night? Uh, they they uh, I remember them saying they had like thirty thousand or forty. They had huge crowds go through this oh, place. It was season, huh? It was packed. <clears throat> it was nonstop. Hmm. On, on weekends. It was just nonstop for four hours. Now, um, of course, they were open every day of the week. And so on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, we'd open at, I think, 7, and we'd shut down at like 8.30 or 8.9. I think oh, it was supposed to go from... Night. I think it's supposed to go from 7 to 10. Again, I've got all the ads, yeah. so we could, we could go back and we could look at the, you know, what the actual hours were and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but that's one of the big differences between then and now. When Haunted Houses first came out in the, in the early and mid-70s, they would open two weeks before Halloween. They would open the Friday that was two weeks. So, And then they'd run every single night. So if we open on a Friday, it might be the 11th of October, it might be the 14th of October, or something like that. And so you'd have 16 nights or 15 nights or something like that. But it was every single night. And it was just for that last half of the month. And of course now it's it's all weekends and many haunted attractions actually start opening in the month of September. Mm -hmm. Okay. On only the busy ones. Yeah. <coughs> will you see a Thursday and Sunday and the really, really busy ones, maybe a Wednesday performance, something like that. Yeah, as you get close to Halloween. In terms of uh incentive were were you paid <coughs> never. those early years so never it was all volunteering right so it was all crazy passion. crazy passion on my part do you want some water well i got some beer here okay. another one we can crack another one you ready <laughs> seriously i'm doing a lot of talking you should do some of the talking <laughs> i'm like, asking questions because they're not interviewing me we want to talk we want to talk about you yeah yeah i guess i'm the object of affection here <laughs> yeah thank you guys for for joining it's tuesday <clears throat> it's uh we're not talking about christmas but we are headlong into christmas uh here in 2019 because people gonna be watching this in 10 years from now and they're gonna be like what year was that yeah mm -hmm. so it's 2019. John Gepperth is watching and he says it's great to get to know you watching this. Every time you help at the haunt, I'm running around and I miss you. Uh, John the Gepperth Mohican at the, the Mohican Schoolhouse. Oh, yeah. He says he never gets to see you because he's running around doing his thing. So he's happy to get to kind of get to know you through mm -hmm. listening to your interview. And then John Passanow uh, do, 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 says, I loved going to JC Haunted Houses. And he had said something about, he says, you are a legend, sir. And then he says beer. Beer. <laughs> you beer. want a, beer. Uh, uh, a regular, like a Bats Blue? Do you want a... a yeah, beer? that'll work. Let's, let's, we'll stay away from the hoppy stuff. The hoppy stuff? You we'll had stay a, away from no, the hoppy stuff. more at the very beginning. Right. All right, so we're going to... Can you see me? Or am I off camera? You're totally off camera. <laughs> I'm off camera. It's kind of cool to be off camera. So Rex from uh, he's playing bartender over there. Yeah, playing right. bartender. We're going super cash tonight. Yeah, right. there you go. Let oh, thank you very much. Glass for you. So let me finish that little bit. That's yeah, in there. well, that's right. You want yeah, to we stuff. we should also talk about the uh, the uh, wide variety of characters that you would see. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah tell us about that. In, in, in the seventies. Yeah. yeah. Did you all do your own makeup? Or was there someone kind of slathering you all with the makeup and then you would figure out what the character was after they smacked <laughs> some stuff on your face? Of course, it's mostly masks back mm -hmm. then. Right. Guys, no, if you true. want to grab a beer and eat some Cheetos, now would be the time to grab it. That's we're pouring one for us. <laughs> <laughs> so you put your masks on and yeah. you just kind of choose for the night what mask you wanted to wear? And then... No, no. Uh -uh. I, no, I did makeup being a, a, a makeup person. Sure. I never wore a you mask. You had the theater. I wasn't interested in wearing a mask. Mm hmm but what I was leading up to is that um, there wasn't much uh, variety as far as characters when you went to Haunted Attractions. You saw the universal, you know, horror movie characters. Wolfman, mm -hmm. Frankenstein, Dracula. Dracula, The Mummy. Mm -hmm. All 
right? Some ghosts, all right? Somebody in a gorilla suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what else. There's not too much else. Was it mostly men acting? No, there were, there were the, women. But was the majority and were the women more the victim at that time? Very much so. Women yeah. were almost exclusively victims in the 1970s. Sure. That, that's a question I was waiting for Roger to ask me. Oh. Well, the question I was waiting for you to ask me was, what are the big differences that you see between haunted houses then and now? Mm -hmm. and I, would, I would have got to that, but yeah, tell, tell, tell us. But yeah. the rise of women has always been one of my top three, maybe top two mm. uh, answers to that. What an incredible difference as far as women goes, mm -hmm. okay? And, you know, na nowadays, you know, women own haunted attractions all over the place. When I was a, a board member of the International Association mm -hmm. of Haunted Attractions, my boss was a woman, Deanne Dagan. She ran a, mm -hmm. a haunted attraction in Fort Worth, Texas called Hangman's House of Horrors. I went down there and acted in the place. Yeah. We've been to, I'm sure you've been to haunted attractions that have been run by women as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big, big difference. Where did you see the shift? Was it um, in the 80s? When, when did you see the shift for women flipping over from and I'm sure the women were enjoying because that was all that was there at the time of being the victim you know getting their throat slit or eaten by the vampire or whatever it is but when did it start flipping over to the women becoming different characters was it in the 80s more when there were more horror movies with women that were scarier because there wasn't a lot of that in the 70s even to the late 70s. Yeah, that's true. There was not a lot of that in, in the 70s and mm -hmm. the late 70s. And it was only uh, when we started putting uh, actors organizations together yeah. uh, that I really saw that big change. You know, I had absolutely no problems with, with women. And and I want to go back to something that you were saying, and, and the women probably enjoyed just lying there and getting their throat slit and so forth. I doubt it. Okay. Because were they only lying there? It was really just them kind of laying there and screaming. Laying at there the time? and screaming, ah. but laying there and actually lying, lying there and screaming. Yeah, I know I'm the English major, right? <laughs> exactly. Lying there and screaming, and also freezing too, because they're wearing these little dainty costumes, you know, that's revealing ah, pretty much everything go. about them. Okay. Yep. yep. And it's chilly inside the damn haunted house. Okay. So they really were more a prop than anything else at they that point. They were a prop. Here's one big thing, mm -hmm. and I encountered this in more than one haunted attraction. A woman was not allowed to act in a scene by herself. It was feared that she would be assaulted. Okay? Sure. That she wouldn't sure. be able to fight back and fight off anybody. Sure. And there wasn't the uh, well, security, we, right? Well, we learned that. Okay. Yeah. Women can take care of themselves. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've been there. Yep. Right. I, I remember going through those haunts at the time, and mm -hmm. there would be uh, tables with holes that you could, women could stick their leg in the hole, and then they, were, oh, they had the chainsaws and stuff or electric saws that were sawing them up. And mm -hmm. um, so you're you're in a fast track, right? So it's the seventies. And and now now what happened? So you're you're still in the seventies because last we talked, you're in the um, Cleveland the guillotine yeah. room, right? Right. Uh huh. And so where yeah, we, we left off in nineteen seventy six. Yeah, nineteen seventy six. And so where? So tell us the next four or five years. I mean, we're mm. same room, same haunt, same team. What happened from there? Okay, so in nineteen seventy six, this this haunt that I'm talking about, this. Cleveland Jaycee's Haunted House at the corner of Richmond and Harvard Roads in Lawrenceville Township was run by the Cleveland Jaycee's. And that was the final year that they elected to run that particular haunted house. So they ran it from 1972 up until 1976. And then beginning in 1977, that very same haunt was taken over by the Police Athletic League of Cleveland. They ran it for three years, 77, 78, and 79. And then they got out of it and that haunted house went away. And then we had to go find, Rex had to go find someplace else to go act. All right, I'm out on the street as they say, okay? I gotta find another joint. So you act in that same haunt for uh, four years. For four years. Right. Tell us about those years. They were the great years. They were fabulous years. You're in your years. 20s. I'm in my 20s. And even though the house was taken over by the Police Athletic League, 
<clears throat> there were very few haunted attractions, you know, in the greater Cleveland area. Still, just the three um, JC haunts and maybe one in Lake County, and that was pretty much it. So, I won't say the world was our oyster, but we didn't have a lot of competition, and we were really good at what we did. You know, many of those people made their way over into the Legion of Terror, okay? So, mm -hmm. these people were really into it and really good. And we rocked that joint, and it was very sad you know, when that when that haunted house went away. But we had to, you know, it evolved. All had all had to go do something else. So 1979. So in 1979, I got really upset when that haunted house went away, and I decided that I didn't want this to end. I had so much fun working in the haunted house, and so many friends. I had never had so much fun in my entire life as working in this haunted attraction. So I actually started a corporation for haunted attraction actors in 1979. It was originally called the Inter International Association of Ghouls and Goblins, which was just way the hell too long. And so we changed the name after a few months. It got changed to the Knights of Fright is what it got changed to. And we kind of uh, jumped around to different spots in 1980. Uh, we worked at Franklin Castle, which is on like West 45th and Franklin Avenue in, in Cleveland. Uh, in 1981, uh, we went and worked at this haunted house in Middleburg Heights for Middleburg Heights and, and Berea, the, the two cities put together. This is where we, we, we uh, uh, ran into some people. Oh, gosh. Uh, who was Beast? Um, Vince. Yeah, Vince. This is where no, Vince. Frank. Yeah, Vince Westfall. Yeah, Vince Westfall. Vince, yeah. Vince Westfall there. Yep. Worked there. 1982, we said, okay, we're going to go try putting on our own haunted house again. And we got in a, a, a vacant, I believe it was a Radio Shack store on Southgate Park Boulevard in Maple Heights and put on a, a show called Chambers of Terror, which didn't work out very well at all. <laughs> <laughs> and 1983, uh, I said, okay, you know, let, let's see what I can do here. And I heard about a job where I could get hired to run a haunted attraction in the basement of the old Federated Department Store at the corner of Brook Park and Pearl in the city of Cleveland, which turned out to be, turned into Cleveland Haunted Hollow that ran for many, many years mm -hmm. uh, down there. And I was at that for like, I don't know, four or five evenings of production. And they said, oh, well, we want, we want all of you to stay until 2.30. Because the haunted house being in the basement was right next door to a big, huge dance club called the Mining Company, mm -hmm. which was open until 2.30. And, of course, the bar was open until 2.30. And I'm looking at my watch going, you know, I got to go to work in the morning. And so that didn't work out for very long. So, as I said, that, that lasted for like four or five days. And uh, one of the people that had been at the uh, Richmond Road Haunted House, the Cleveland uh, JC's Haunted House, a guy by the name of Steve Porson, uh, Steve calls me up and says, Hey, there's this haunted house out in Broadview Heights. Let's go check them out. I, so I got a few details from them. I told the story to, the, to everybody. At the, uh, when I got inducted to the Legion Hall of Fame about three years or so ago. So it's Saturday, September the, or excuse me, October the 8th, um, 1983. And it's about 1230 in the afternoon. And I picked that time specifically thinking, okay, anybody that's working inside the haunted house is going to have lunch and they're going to come outside where it's sunny and so forth, rather than, you know, mm -hmm. eating their lunch inside of a dank, dreary haunted attraction and I show up there and there's one guy there his name is Ken Marshall and I introduce myself and tell him hey we got, I got a bunch of actors that would like to you know come out here and you know try acting your haunted house and he walks over to a big cooler that's lying on the ground opens it up takes out a can of beer and hands it to me and said let's talk okay. <laughs> Kenny. That, that's how the Legion of Terror well what be turned into the Legion of Terror, it was still the Knights of Fright at that point, uh, came to be associated with Bloodview Haunted House. So I've here, I've talked for the last three or four minutes, let's let you talk. <laughs> so 
the the original name was the bef- prior to the Knights of Fright was the International Ghouls something Ghouls and Goblins. I got all Society the, of I got all of the documents at home someplace. International Order of Ghouls, Goblins, and or Ghouls and Goblins or something like that. It was. I think it was the result of a of a enlarged ego. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I'll tell you what. That would be a great retro shirt, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, there's no t-shirts from that. No was, t-shirts from it. No, no, because we changed the name after a few months, saying this is just an unworkable name. So. I kind of like the name, right? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be fun to wrap it around a shirt. I don't but know. yeah, with uh, with the Knights of Fright, I mean, I got it incorporated by the state of Ohio. I argued with the Internal Revenue Service for three flipping years to get us turned into a public charity, not a not a um, a charitable organization. Uh, the the <clears throat> the code sections in the Internal Revenue Service, five hundred one c three is for a charitable foundation. Those are easy as pie to get. If you want to be a public charity where the money that you give to them and so forth is all tax deductible. That's a whole different kettle of salami. That's what's known as a 509A2. And it took three years of sending letters back and forth with the Internal Revenue Service Office in Cincinnati before they finally granted me that, okay? Yeah. Hmm. For not, okay? Because I, I thought we would, you know, I, I looked upon the organization as an organization that was going to put on uh, haunted houses, okay, mm-hmm. and and also do other types of, of artwork too, sculpture, painting, uh, molding, and so forth. Maybe teach some classes. Maybe become some sort of a um, a uh, an art institute. It was yeah. was my vision on all of this, and nobody else had the same vision as mine. Yeah. So yeah. I was outvoted. Okay. Oh well. Might be interested in finding out if there's any other. Um, shows out there that have taken on that same purpose, right? It's to say, well, we're going to be an epicenter of training. We're going to put on shows, but we're also going to train. Right. Because that's, that's, that certainly has, I think, my, that's where my passion lies, certainly. All right. right. And, and, and when, <clears throat> when you look at what it turned into, the Legion of Terror, uh, it wasn't so much of a, a training organization or an educational organization it was by and large an acting organization Mm -hmm. and i wanted a lot more from that having come from uh the production side of of the theatrical business it's like there's a lot more to do here dude okay you got a parking lot you got a concession stand you got to print some tickets uh you got to print some flyers and do some advertising and about 471 other different things if you want to put on you know a haunted attraction yeah yeah okay so were you uh, called in as a show doctor after that? So, I mean, you're 70s and you were 10, 10 years of legitimate theater. That's then, all. The... Then you introduced to Hans and then what happened? So, yeah. like, you never, like... never, I have never gone back to legitimate theater. Why? Oh, Haunted Houses is so much more fun. <laughs> so much more fun. <laughs> Elaborate. So, so we all have an idea about what fun is, but uh, but there has to be has to be other or, or expound upon that so um traditional theater is you had uh, alluded that traditional theater means a script right it's and, a script and, and you're you're you work for a a role and that's your role but a hunt is different and you cannot change that script you have a particular character you can't change the costume or the makeup for that particular yeah. character you can't change the movement of that character. You can't do anything to it. You've got to follow that script. Mm-hmm. All right. And when you're in the haunted business, man, the pie in the sky, look as ugly as you want to, act as weird as you want to, act as cuckoo as you want to, say whatever you want to say within reason. Okay. And I, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't use any of those four letter words. I right. never have. And I, I, I look upon it as, as a sign of, of being a good performer <clears throat> that I don't have to use that kind of foul language as a prop. Uh-uh. Yep. And, uh, and insulting as well. Okay. Insulting. So whenever the big fat ugly girls come through, I don't call them that. They're gorgeous. Hello, beautiful. <laughs> yes, my pet. I've been looking for someone like you. 
You're the only one. Get a close up on that one. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> but you get what, you get what I mean. Yeah, right? you you didn't have to go for the cheap crutch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your ass. You were you know, able to continue you know, going. It, it takes two zip codes to fit your ass inside of you know, or something like that. Something rude. Okay. There's no need to do anything like no, that. No. no, not at all. Absolutely. Not at all. Not if you're an inventive and. Exactly. You know, using that old noodle. Okay? Yeah. So. Obviously, what you were doing at the time was improv and creative and stuff like that. Did you? We still do. Yeah. All did the you time. define it at that point? Were you like, "This is what we're doing," or <clears throat> did you just do it? And that's just what we did. We're going, you know, going to uh, to haunted house. And just like pretty much that was it. Yeah. Um, the uh, the first year that that we did things and that I did things in 1974. Well, we didn't know any better. Had never been to a haunted house. Had no idea. So we did kind of try to script it a little bit. We had this Phantom of the Opera uh, scene up where I was uh, uh, acting as a as a zone leader and so forth. And you know that's that's pretty simple. Uh, you take the mask off and yeah, you know, with the girl and the girl yeah shrieks and screams and that's pretty much the end of that act. Yeah. But moving over to the J.C. Sonnet House in 1976. Just about everybody in there was doing some sort of improv acting stuff and really enjoying it. And it's like, this is perfect for me. I love this. <laughs> There's no script to memorize. There's no five or six weeks worth of rehearsal, five nights a week that you have to go through before you go on to a play. People don't think about that stuff. But if it's a straight play, you got five weeks of rehearsal. If it's a musical, you got six weeks of rehearsal. You gotta memorize this whole damn book, memorize those songs, try to dance when, like me, you're not really a dancer, okay, or much of a singer. But with the haunted house business, it's like tear into them, okay. So your legitimate theater acted for how many? What was the, what was your full house, typically? Your cut your your audience. Um, it, you it, said Peninsula is about one hundred and twenty. It's about one hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifty five. And and it was about the same when you would go to other community theaters. If you would go to the Jewish Community Center in Cleveland Heights, where I worked, or if you went to um, Spring Valley Little Theater, or if you went to Bedford Community Theater, or some of the other places, you're typically looking at 150 or 200 people, and as opposed to thousands of people in a night, right? At a night, and all these people on a play, you can't see them. Because there's a bazillion, you know, stage lights that are shining straight into your face, okay? And plus, I hadn't really started wearing contact lenses yet at that point. <clears throat> so I'm acting without my glasses because everything is a flipping blur out there, okay? And you have no idea what's going on. But in the haunted house business, they're coming by you one after the next, after the next, after the next. And they're this far away from you. They're right in front of you. And there were some certain uh, acts that I've done over the years where uh, we set up the scene so that people had to squeeze by me. That was how close we got. I got to them. That's how close I wanted to be at them. So I could leer at them and their face would be right about here or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was worried about getting kicked or punched or something like that. But fortunately, nothing like that ever happened to me. I guess I've been lucky. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you get a couple squeezes? Oh, I've been squeezed. <laughs> and and it's fine when the girls squeeze me, but when the guys start squeezing me, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Or the girls start flashing you, hmm. That's nice, but you shouldn't be doing this here in public, okay? You shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to come back to this, but I do recall coming through the Love You Haunted House as a customer. This is before I acted. It was... 80s, I'm assuming. And you what, were playing. What year, what year did you start at Bloodview? I was there at 90 and officially acted a full season in 91. Did you act at all in 90? No. Okay. No, nope. was up there. It had come up. Had, uh, Spencer Town was going to volunteer that year. Okay. Just pulled back. 91 was, was the year. But this is 80s. I, I couldn't <clears> tell you <throat> what year. It was the old house. Right. Um, mm -hmm. A farmhouse, yeah. Yeah. And, and Zart, I was. Uh, I was. Um, welcome by Zargon. Were you really? Yeah, I did. You did. No kidding. And uh, and I remember that it was it was a striking 
memory, you know, back then, <laughs> uh, not knowing that. Uh, was I in makeup at the time? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh boy. Yeah, acting, full makeup. You were in, oh, and you were a customer. I was a customer. Oh, and you were okay. acting. I okay. I believe you were in a black black costume, maybe robe. Yep, floor. Yep, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was it. Not the full leather zargon, which uh, which is. So memorable. Yeah, that that was I 90s. didn't bring any of those pictures with me, Darren. Yeah, that wasn't until the 90s that yeah, he went 90s. full full Zargon. I had to get Pat Rucker to make that costume yeah. for me. And that, that was, was, that was memorable. Jack Morbido is watching. If you want to hey, say hi, Jack. Jack. Hey, Jack, I tried calling you a few weeks ago, dude. I, I, I need to talk to you about something. Oh, All right, get on it, Jack. We hope you're well. Yeah, and I hope you're doing good, Jack. But I do need to speak to you, please. Um, so you're a blood reader. Mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden, uh, <clears throat> you've got a group of actors. Kenny Marshall hands you a beer, says, let's talk. And, mm -hmm. and, and next, you, what, what happens next? So what happens next is, is um, <clears throat> I start calling people um, that I'm still associated with, like Ed McKenna and, and Mike Spellacy and, and Cashman and, and Katie and you know some other folks. And says, hey, come on over here and check this place out. Well, it didn't take very long. Um, for everybody that I knew to show up and go, well, this is great, man. Because the, the Broadview Heights Lions are kind of standing around going, who are these people? <laughs> and boy, are they good. Wow, are they good. Holy moly, they're good. Uh, we're just going to let them stay here and, and, and do it. Yeah, that's... Man, it, these... it was a Lions club, right? Yeah, it was a Lions time? club. Yeah. And the Lions are going, oh, no. Moly, these people are good at what they're doing. And of course, we were good at what we'd been doing. We'd been doing for, for a number of years. Yeah, for that yes. time. How many years at that point for you? Uh, well, in our first year was 83, so I had been doing it for like nine years or something like that at that point. Yeah, right. so you already had almost a decade under your belt, right? Yeah, so we had experience. And the other ones have been doing it since the 70s as well. Yeah. So they all had experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was a great thing. It was it was a great thing. It's like, wow, this is great. So the the lions saw the potential of what was going on here. So they added on to the haunted house. Uh, they made a lot of effort to to bring in some more uh, good scenery and and so forth. Uh, they listened to suggestions that we had as far as you know how to change the the maybe the layout of the house and so forth or room ideas. They were very receptive. They were they were wonderful to work with. They're, all my experience over the years of working with different charitable organizations, hands down, they're the best. Yeah. Hands yeah. down. And so that group was called... It's still called the Knights of Fright. It was called the Knights of Fright at the time. The Legion of Terror did not uh, arrive on the scene until 1985. Okay. Okay. How'd that transition occur? That transition occurred because I wasn't really around that much. Okay. I had gotten uh, married for the second time, and um, without going into a great deal of detail, uh, my second wife had hated the haunted house, wanted me to have nothing whatsoever to do with it, um, and she became a real boat anchor on my life, and so I did very little acting in 1985 and 1986. Okay. And so since I wasn't around, um, and I had kind of been the sort of leader of the whole thing, uh, other people stepped in, especially Ed McKenna. Ed had always had ideas that the Legion should be an acting organization only and that it should kind of resemble uh, the pecking order of medieval knights where you would have squires and pages and knights and, and whatever else in there. He had, I, maybe that came from all the gaming that he did. I, I don't know because I'm not a gamer. Yeah. Couldn't yeah. tell you and so forth. So the... The, uh, the Knights of Fright uh, and ended, the Legion of Terror began in 1985, and they kind of went off in their own di direction as far as the type of organization that they wanted to do. Uh, of course, I was a member of the Legion of Terror, but I was never part of the management or the leadership. I never ran for a lord. Uh, I figured, okay, this is their organization. You know, they can go do it, you know, the, the way that they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I thought to myself, you know what, Rex, you're a lucky guy because you don't have to go in there and do any work. 
okay? All you have to do is just show up in October, <clears throat> put on makeup and costume, get in there and scare the loving you-know-what out of people, go to the bar after every performance and have a good time, and come, you know, beginning of November, see you next year, boys and girls. And I didn't have to put in a lot of effort, because I've been putting in so much effort the previous few years. I was just tired of it. So it was actually it was a good thing yeah. that the Legion came in and, and shook things up and took everything in a in a different direction. I wasn't needed. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't needed. We're uh, we're into for those who are joining Rex B. Hamilton, he's a legend. Uh, I think we came to the conclusion that he probably holds two world records if uh, once we nominate him. Yeah, for please please do. Longest running and working the most commercial uh, haunted attractions. Um, we talked about his start in 1974. We're now into the 80s. We've already gone through 15 years. Tell us a couple of looks. And, and is this, is this, uh, tell us about this character here. And we got, we got a book down here. And so, um, yeah, maybe you should show. Before we start talking about yeah. this, maybe well, show, show us show us a couple pictures, and well, we'll hold up to the camera so people get some visuals. There's one, there's one Zargon picture in here, and you may want to take it out of the out of the plastic before you, before you hold it up in front of the camera. Uh, well, here, this is actually what the character looks. Now you can't see the costume and so forth. So tell us about Zargon. So I will tell you about him, but why don't you show that? And then I got one. Ouch. Just got myself with the... Is that too... Tell me if that's... That's good. I thought I had Turn another one in here with me. Darn it. What year is this again, Rex? That picture would have been taken in the very early 80s. Okay. Because that's my first wife that's in there, Margaret. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is your Zargon character. That is Zargon character. Darn, I thought I had more pictures with me. I guess I didn't bring any. Dang it. So we got Zargon here. Right. So it's it's black leather, black spikes, or excuse me, not black spikes, but uh, silver makeup, silver makeup, glow in the dark. Actually, you can't see it, but there's some glow in the dark in the hair, and there's some glow in the dark on the face. So there's actually two faces on that character. Yeah. One for for visible light, and then one for ultraviolet light. The character changes under ultraviolet light. Of course, the silver makeup will reflect the purple color of the ultraviolet light. I'm really proud of this. And then the ultra, and then the uh, uh, phosphorescent makeup glows green. So I go from a silver face character under regular light to a purple and green character under ultraviolet light. Because I was just trying to be as mean and wicked and evil and nasty as I possibly could be. Did you do that every time you did Zargon? I did that every time that I did Zargon. I, must, I did not know that you did that. I must never have seen Zargon in the dark because I had no idea that you did that. I tried taking pictures of myself a couple, three times. Mm -hmm. But when you're under ultraviolet light and back in the days of film, long before digital, Lady Gabal, we could never get yep. you know, a picture that came out well of me. But that was the, that's the way that it came out. Okay? Now, now your card is silver. Correct. Well, is that is that... Connected? It certainly is connected to the silver makeup, yes. And this is the character Zargon. Tell Correct. us a little bit about the naming of your character. Well, the naming of the character... Is upside down? <laughs> <laughs> what now? I was upside down. Beth no, is, Beth upside is doing down. this, and the reason, why, <laughs> the reason why I'm upside down is because I'm checking out this one, which I'll... This is, this is a great photo, too, which, which yeah, I'll... Yeah, show them that picture. That picture tell us about Zargon first. That picture is 2016, I think, for Phantom of the Opera. So... Uh, as we've talked about this before, when you're back in the 70s, uh, so many of the characters inside Haunted Houses are movie characters. Wolfman, Phantom of the Opera, blah, 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 you know, Dracula and so forth. Well, you, me, again, I've got an ego the size of North Dakota, and I want something different. I want to be a star. I'm not interested in being the best vampire in the world. I want to be somebody completely different. Well, I was also a fan of Star Trek episodes. And one of the one of the bad guys in one of the Star Trek episodes from the '60s was a character named Sargon, which which starts with the letter S, S A R G O N. Went to the library and looked it up, and, and lo and behold, it's truly a historical characters. Actually, there's three of them. They were they were three uh, kings of ancient Assyria. Okay, modern day Syria, modern day Iraq. Okay, back in the seventh and the eighth and the ninth centuries B.C. 
The three of them are not related. They just took each other's names over a course of 100 or 150 years. And these people were horrible. They were horrible warlords. You know, they'd, they'd look around every spring and go, all right, which way, which way are we going to attack this year and go slaughter people and burn their villages to the ground and rape and pill? These people were horrible. You yep. heard stories about Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler was a Sunday school teacher compared to these guys. I was looking for who's the worst person in history that I could find. And this Sargon II was the worst person that I could find. Well, I didn't want to use that particular word. I wanted to change it a little bit. So I just changed the first uh, character from an S to a Z, and that's where the Zargon comes from. Hmm. Okay, I wanted to be the worst. Okay, <laughs> not just some sh you know Schlemiel from Cleveland, Ohio. I wanted to be the worst. Okay? I wanted to be the worst. Spelled with a Z. With a Z. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I thought that the the uh, the silver makeup. Um, even though it's not the first silver makeup you've ever seen. You've seen the Tin Man from The Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz. You've seen that before. But thinking about how haunted houses were lit back then, most haunted attractions uh, had like a single light inside of them. They had what's known as a PAR bulb, a, mm -hmm. uh, a parabolic aluminized reflector bulb. That's the kind of bulb that used to hang over your garage. Kind of mm -hmm. looks like a teardrop sort of shaped thing. And they... It would be 150 watts, and they'd stick it in the, you know, in a mount in the corner of, of the scene, and you'd get this wash all over the scene, and everything would turn orange, or everything would turn blue, you know, and your makeup job, whatever it was, went right out the window because of the, of the conflicting colors with it. And I thought, okay, well, silver will reflect any color that happens to shine upon me, so I'll go with silver. Mm. Okay. Zargon. And you had a, a cast of other characters. When, and name a couple of characters and when they came about. Uh, well, I, I only did Zargon for the first 10 years. Oh. I, I, I did that character every single night, every single year. Okay. Nothing but. And then? Nothing but. And then what happened? Well, after 10 years, I said to myself, you know what, Rex, there should be something else that you could do. Let's think. Well... <clears throat> One of the things I've always been blessed with is I have a lot of hair. And I thought, well, what can we do with our hair? Well, let's try, you know, sticking it up in the air and, and spikes and so forth and see what transpires after that. So in 1984, and here's a photograph right mm -hmm. here. This is, this is the very first time that I did this particular character. This is October of 1984. Yeah. And this is who? I mean, I know who it is, but... Or I, I didn't know. For, I, I decided to use a butcher's apron uh, because before doing Zargon uh, for the first year or two at, uh, at Richmond Road, they actually had me play a mad butcher. So I had that but I went to the store and bought that butcher's apron that you see right there. <clears throat> you wear a Zargon sweatshirt over there? And there's a Zargon t shirt that's that, awesome. that I had made at Daffy Dance, right? Uh -huh. I still have that shirt. That's awesome. It is. <clears throat> so, you're, so you started adding to your cast of characters, right? Yeah, and I thought, well, let, let's try putting in some sort of a crazy butcher character. So I said, well, maybe we'll call him Butch the Butcher. And I don't know if, how well you can see this up here, but this is actually scar skin is what this is, which is a combination of nose putty, which I don't know if anybody uses nose putty, or it's also called dermal wax. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people who use it. Yeah, do they still use it oh, yeah. to this yeah, day? It's, it's real big. I don't see people using it anymore, but I'll take your word for I, it. I don't know so much in, in the haunts, although there's some haunts that people do the old school, but a lot of effects folks are using it uh, for gashes and stuff like this. It, yeah, it's usually used on stage because yeah. you're a long way away on stage and it's a lot easier to hide the, you know, the scenes and, and, and whatnot. But this stuff is actually called scar skin, is what it's called, because it's, it's actually dermal wax. And at the, at the factory, they shoot it through with all kinds of tiny little cotton fibers, so it has some body to it. Okay, and then the um, these are actually <laughs> these these are actually Chinese noodles aren't out here. These are not these are not pasta noodles. These are kind of like the chow mein noodles that you got to put in the toaster oven for five minutes so they get nice and crispy and so forth. That's what those are. And the idea there, 
I don't think it really came out that well, but the idea was my skin is, is rotting away and there's maggots that are starting to come out of my head. At least that was the idea yeah. that I was going with. And also the machete that you see there in my hands, that's a real machete. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it's dulled down quite a bit, but you can still really hurt somebody badly, even with a dull machete. Okay. So your machete, was that, uh, um, which is main cop? Uh, actually, I just found it lying around. Oh. I, <laughs> I did. I said, oh, it. this is mine well, for the rest of the season. This is mine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, but Butch evolved. It Butch, right? Butch certainly evolved. And I didn't know what to do with this particular character. I didn't have any new dialogue for it or knew any acting. I was just doing the same character, but I just looked different. All right. I was still some, you know, crazy maniac that was shrieking at people and charging after them. And I just so happened that instead of having a chain in my hand, unfortunately we don't have any photos of me. Instead of having a big length of chain in my hand, now I've got a machete. Yeah. Big difference, right? Okay. And just different makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, but I wanted to do something different. And, and, and I know that uh, we looked up looked upon uh, haunted house acting and that there were three styles of haunted house acting. One of them is um, power acting, number number two is crazy and insane, and number three is slow and stupid. Okay, mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. I've been doing the power acting. I want to do something else. I wanted to be crazy, crazy, insane type of person. And it took me three years. It took me all the way up until 1987 to figure out, oh, it's okay to be a moron. It's okay to be stupid and goofy and make absolutely no sense. And that's truly where Butch the Butcher came from when it dawned on me, okay, Rex, you can be a moron, okay? And people will love it. So show them this picture, Roger. Yeah, so, uh, oh, this is also, well, we're showing the picture, but this is also a recent induction yeah, to... Yeah, a recent award, yeah. Yeah, the Honda, can you see that for a minute? Um, it's a bit... So this is the evolution. This is Butch today, the butcher, and, and what is this picture? That was taken in 2017. 2017, okay. and so yeah. you look quite different, and you got some spikes on your head. And is this the same apron, or it is the same apron? Nice. Wow. It is the same apron. And so this character now is a silly, crazy. You said, "Are oh, you all just?" Moron, right? Oh yeah, I I tell people if it were possible for a human being to loop the loop, this guy could loop the loop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I kind of modeled the the character a little bit on Curly from the Three Stooges, mm -hmm. and also pretended that I was a surfer dude from California with a small amount of brain damage. Okay. So I took all of those things and mushed them together, and and that's where the character right. for for that uh, comes from. Yeah. These, if I were to say which characters, if you had to describe the well-known characters from Rex, these would be the two that I would mention, right? These are, these are your two icon, Rex's icon characters, right? I, I did them so much, yes. Yeah, I yeah. did them so much, yes. But how, how many other characters have you done? Oh, I've probably done characters? at least 20 characters. 20 characters? And some of them, you know, just like you, you've mm -hmm. done, I mean, they're one-offs, just do them one evening yeah so this was here's another photo because we wanted to give some visual i love that particular yeah movie. so this is uh that's the phantom of the opera. phantom of the opera but this was how many years ago you were at trans world yeah that's 2016 i believe 2016 and so you've done characters of all sorts over the years yeah, is that right sorts. yeah yeah all right so oh we should show them what yeah i mean Open up and give us give us some. Uh, oh yeah, you got some other photos in it. Well, I was just gonna say one. Let's just show them. Here's the most recent thing that I did. Uh, just this year, show them one of these pictures of this demonic scarecrow. That's just from from uh, this yeah. year. I did this character. You because you and I mm -hmm. worked together and you saw me do this character. This Very nice. Yeah. So it's got a lot of burlap. This is a quick in. Right, believable. <clears throat> yeah, this is this is a great character. So this is recent stuff. Right. I'm gonna flip through here a little bit. 
Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> Dr. Giggles. I've done Dr. Giggles a lot, too. Yeah, you've done Dr. Giggles. I'm going to flip through here just so people kind of get some of these uh, these visuals. Oh, there's a great picture, Dr. Giggles. Um, and again, these, these <clears throat> new characters that you're coming up with are hitting all over the country now, not just here because right. you've got Broadview that you can always go back to, but you're traveling everywhere to whatever haunted attractions you can across the country. Right. So instead of just being Northeast Ohio. No, I'm going all over yeah. the place. Including you were in Hong Kong. Correct. In 90... 2001. 2001. So not very many people can say that. Yeah, I'm the first American haunted house actor in China. See? There you go. Hard to argue that. So tell so tell us that uh, how how that went about. So you you're acting at uh, Broadview Haunted Bloodview Haunted House with the Legion of Terror, and then you launch out into other space. Tell us tell us. Oh. How did you start guest yeah. acting? How did you get yeah? How did that guest acting? Well, oh, I've been guest acting for a long time. I mean, even when in 1979 when uh, the uh, Cleveland Police Athletic League shut down uh, the haunted house at Richmond and Harvard that had been the Cleveland JC's haunted mm -hmm. house, the one that I worked with for four years. Well, it wasn't quite October yet. It was like, I don't know, four or five days before October. And um, I, I got to go find some place to act. So I did just that. I went to other haunted attractions in the greater Cleveland area. So the business of going out on the road and working at other haunted attractions, I've been doing that now for 40 years, yeah. okay? Now, hadn't done it that much up until you and I started doing it in, right. in the mid-90s, maybe about 25 years or so ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I would do it here and there. I would go to different places. Um, I, I would often say to myself, okay, I'll go work every night at, at Love You. You know, work doing characters, but I'm going to take one night off for me, and I'm going to go find some other haunted attraction here in the area, and, and just go work there for an evening, just to keep my hand in, so to speak. So now we're mid '90s, late '90s, and you're out on the road the entire season, just about, right? I mean, you're you're coming back to Bloodview one or two nights a season, but you're out and about. Right, yeah, because in 1996, uh, we all resigned from the Legion of Terror, and we all kind of, well, you know, went our separate ways, which was fine with me because it's a big, wide world out there, and there, and also it was at the time when the internet was just starting to come about, and um, of course the only place I could get the internet was at my office at work. You know, I, nobody had internet at their home except for dial-up in you know in '95 or '96 or something like that. And uh, so I'd be doing all the surfing on the internet at work and going, "Wow, look at this! There's haunted houses that are actually outside of the Greater Cleveland area." For years, I had gone to uh, the Cleveland Public Library in the month of November. Uh, every year and I had uh, gone to the microfilm section or the old newspaper sections and gone to papers from New York or Detroit or St. Louis or all the big cities, Chicago or the big cities and got their weekly entertainment guide where you'd see all the movies and plays and theater and dance and restaurants and this that and the other because that's typically where the newspaper advertisements would be for haunted attractions and so I'd be in the library for a few hours and looking through the Chicago Tribune or the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or the Atlanta Constitution Journal going, did it work? Could never find a single ad, not a single one, hmm. for haunted attractions in other cities. In the 90s? So it made me think, this must be something that's just unique to Northeastern Ohio. We must be the only place in the world that has haunted attractions. And of course, boy, was I wrong about that. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the internet came along, about the time that, that we all start hitting the road and so forth, oh boy, it's a big wide world out there. And yes, there are places uh, to go act. Yes, there are. So you're out on the road, you're, uh, you're getting on planes, you're flying to China, you're acting in China, you're acting around the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I were traveling at some of those some of those weekends were in Chicago. Yeah, we went to Chicago. Yeah, we've been to Omaha. We went to Omaha. All over the place. Yeah, that was fun. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, 
so now we've got 70s, 80s, 90s, we're in the 2000s, you're all over the place. I'm and starting to feel old, dude. Yeah, so now we're in the, the 2000, <laughs> what, are, what is it, 2010s, teens? I don't even know how to describe the last 10 years. The teens, I the suppose. Teens. We'll call them the teens. Mm -hmm. The first decade we're going to wind up calling the aughts, aughts, I think, at some point. Is that yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. O-U-G-H-T-S, mm -hmm. the aughts. And so now you've got how many years of hunt acting experience? Well, this year, this was, year. This year was number 45. 45. 45. What's, uh, what are your observations? Because, I mean, you're looking at 1974 to 2019. What's changed? I mean, we, we talked about that a little bit before. Yeah, we did. And, and our playing right now in the haunted attraction industry. Uh, ben, they, they do everything. They do just as much as men do, mm -hmm. if not more. I mean, if you look at the biostatistics of the United States of America, there are six and a half million more women in this country than there are men. Okay? So, the days of, you know, turning up your nose at women and so forth, those days are long, long gone, especially in the haunted attraction industry. Okay? I give women absolutely you know, full reign to do anything they want to do, just like I would do with a guy. Go for it. And they're not uh, printing off flyers anymore and hand delivering those, right? Because you said 74, people were here. How, how were you advertising in 74 compared to what's going on now? Yeah, in 74, the, the biggie was newspaper advertisements. Yeah. You should have seen the, the, uh, the first advertisement that came out for Hudson. Hudson, when they started in 1972, I think they took out two entire pages in the Friday Magazine, which is, was the weekly entertainment supplement for the daily newspaper here in the Cleveland area, which is the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Mm -hmm. That cost them a bucket load of money to buy that particular ad. But that was really the only way to do it. News, or excuse me, radio and TV, uh, just way too expensive. You know, to do that sort of thing. So, yeah, lots of flyers, but mostly newspaper advertisement to begin with. Mm -hmm. And now, newspaper doesn't even really exist in hunts. I went, I went looking through the Plain Dealer and also the Scene Magazine uh, this year. I did not see one single advertisement for a haunted hmm. attraction in print. I didn't see one. Because I collect all those. Yeah, yeah. I don't see many <coughs> gorillas anymore. I think I think somebody should bring those back. I, they, uh, I think they were fun and they were frightening at the time. What about <laughs> characters, right? I mean, it was right the Hollywood black and white characters back then. Now, what's what is the entertainment? How has that changed in your perspective? It's all a function of your imagination. We don't. We're not going back through movie books anymore going, oh, let's see if we can find any more pictures of movie monsters. No, uh-uh. It's, it's all up to the imagination. So, and, and that's a tough one to put a handle on to because who's the most imaginative, imaginative person? Yeah. Who, who can come up with that stuff? Oh, customers. And, and I, was gonna, I was gonna add to that, yeah. uh, that's, that's a conundrum uh, that I go through pretty much every year um, with our friend Jeff Platzer when we try to come up with a, uh, a new makeup job and a new character for me to do on the floor at the Transworld Convention in St. Louis in March. I always get dolled up uh, on the Saturday of that particular convention, and I always want to do something new. <clears throat> and I tell you, it's getting harder and harder to come up with new ideas every year. Something new. Mm -hmm. Hello, customers. <coughs> I really haven't noticed that much difference. You're like, yeah, I mean, 74, I mean, they were, you're seeing probably the same demographics-ish. They're still screaming. They're still... Oh, yeah, they're still screaming. Yeah. They're still having a good time. Yeah. There's still, uh, there's still guys are going there in case there's a screaming girl who wants to grab somebody and... It's still, you know, dealing with the, you know, the occasional jerk, you know, they're saying, well, you can't scare me, blah, 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 blah. You know, you get that. Yeah. You're, I don't think that much has changed. Okay, yeah. I don't think so. Uh, perhaps the haunted house industry has been affected a lot by uh, you know, all the different types of entertainment that we have here because mm -hmm. you know video games and movies and so forth are, are much, much more uh, 
technical than they ever used to be, okay? With CGI and so forth, you can create pretty much anything on a movie screen. If you look at Transformers or X-Men or anything like that, so much of those particular movies all comes out of a computer, you know, as opposed to way back then, you know, with, with Dracula and so forth, they would have to, you know, use whatever tricks of the trade that they had then, you know, they'd stop the camera for a few moments, put a little bit more makeup on you. When the Wolfman changed, take a, a few more frames, put a few more hairs on you, take a few more frames, and so on and so forth to do the transition from a human being and in, into Wolfman, okay? Yeah, we just, yeah, we just CGI it in, no problem, okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't CGI me in, mm -hmm. okay? So I have to figure out what advantages do I have over a CGI generated character? Okay. So we talked a lot about hunting, the evolution, your time since 74 up to present day in 2019. You've also, I can see you're wearing the Minute Syndicate shirt if you've been with us the whole time. We mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Um, Minute Syndicate, tell us a little bit about your experience there and on movie sets and other projects that kind of spawned and, and evolved out of what you do now. Yeah, and, and you and Beth, you, you had a lot to do, you know, with with getting us more jobs and, and saying hey and, and and being with Ed Douglas and Gavin Gosca, you know, because we're not with them together as a group all the time. I see them, you see them, we all have conversations and so forth. So I know you you guys have contributed a lot as far as putting ideas in their heads. It's like, hey, let's do this music video. Hey, let's do this movie at Cedar Point. Hey, let's do this motion picture down at, you know, at, at uh, the Mansfield Reformatory. Hey, let's go do a CD release party and all these different things and so forth. So all of those are there. And, and I think you two can certainly tell a lot of stories about that. The story I want to tell you is yeah. the very first time that I met Ed Douglas um, on the show floor of Transworld. Now Gavin, his partner, Gavin is not the, you know, the the what do the, I the, the face of business. Yeah, I mean, not we, the face. Ed, Ed is always and as the promotion person yeah. mm -hmm. and and the salesman and this that and the other, yeah. the, the glad hander. Mm -hmm. yep. And so you never see Gavin; you just see Ed. So I remember being on the show floor in Chicago, and I'm pretty sure this is 1999. I'm walking around just looking at vendors and so forth. And I here's this eight by, you know, this this ten foot long table with no decorations on it all. It's got a few CDs sitting on the table. They always put a, a you know a sign at the back of each booth that says, you know, here's the number of the booth and you know, here's the name of the company and here's what city they're from. So I'm looking at this at this cardboard sign behind this guy here. And it says Entity Productions, Chardon, Ohio. It's like, oh, okay, because Chardon is a, is a suburb of Cleveland. Chardon's not that far away from us here. And it's like, oh, cool, hometown boy. Let me go talk to this guy here. So I go introduce myself and, and so forth. And it's Ed Douglas, and he's they just released their very first CD, Born in the Night. And he's there to try to sell the thing. Now, what you also have to keep in mind, most of you may not know this, but back in the 90s and the early 2000s, Transworld was a wholesale only uh, type of uh, convention. There were no retail sales allowed. You had to have some sort of a wholesale license or a vendor's license or something like that so that you could buy in bulk. Because the idea was is that you were buying all this stuff, whether it was CDs or costumes or makeup or whatever, and you're going to have it shipped back to your costume and makeup store back in your hometown and sell it there. And I wanted to buy one of his CDs. How many? One. one. <laughs> I wanted a CD. Because, because I, I think I told you, I did sound effects. Yeah. I went to record stores and, and bought all these, these uh, horror sound albums from the cutout bins, okay? Of course, you couldn't listen to records ahead of time or anything like that. You know, and hope to goodness that there was something good on there. And I'd create my own you know, audio tapes on an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and so forth. But it's like, oh, I want this thing. And if memory serves, he was only charging five bucks for it, is what it was. And that, maybe that was the wholesale price on the on the CD at that time. And so I 
kind of gave him 10 pounds of grits and um, and a lot of a lot of smiles and so forth. And he and Ed finally relented and um, and kind of sold me the uh, the CD. I won't say under the table, but he was saying, can you kind of like just write it out and just hand it to me? You know, I've got my checkbook in my hand. I actually went back and, and went through all my files about three or four years ago. I found that check. Found that <laughs> I got that check. Still. Vanity Productions. I remember I ordered yes. it by Born in the Night. Vanity Productions. Right, because that's the that's the parent company of, of Midnight Syndicate. Yeah. Okay, is, is called Entity Productions, and and I told you I gave him ten pounds of grits, and a lot of that was, you guys are into horror music, you and I have got to become friends because I know all these haunted house actors. And he was trying to tell me about how he had, he had tried to make a movie. He had tried to make The Dead Matter yeah. a few years before with a very limited budget. I said, we got all these people. I said, Ed, we can help you out. We know costumes. We know makeup. We know characters. We've been doing this a long time. We're pros at this kind of thing. We got to get together. And that's where I feel most proud of, uh, of my getting together with Midnight Syndicate is I was able to go punch him in the arm, so to speak, you know, and, and whisper sweet nothings in his ear. Mm -hmm. And it paid off for us. Look at that. Yeah. I mean, movies, CD parties, this, that, and the other, yeah. okay? Yeah. Yeah. Going to Cedar Point and shooting movies, you know, in the middle of a deserted amusement park. How fun is that? Uh, yeah, that was that's fabulous. great. Great memories. Great memories. And it just also, again, it all starts with going up and talking to people. You've heard me say this again and again and again. You just have, I told you the story about going up to Kenny Marshall. I'll tell you the story about how I went to China. I just went up to the two pe people from China and said, you need to hire me. I went to Ed Douglas and said, look at this resource. And they're right here in your hometown, dude. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so with that, as we're kind of coming to a close, because okay. we've been talking, we've been talking Almost a lot. Time. Yeah. Woo -hoo. What um, is it? Hour and a half. Wow. Yeah. So where, where, where is Rex Hamilton in 2020 and beyond? That's a good question. Now that I'm retired, I've got a lot more time, and I've sort of been looking forward to that. I uh, I might go to more conventions. I might teach more classes. You know, I might I might I've been asked many times over the years. Hey, would you teach at my a class at my convention or my convention? Well, maybe I'll do that kind of thing. Or uh, I want to go act in horror movies here in, in here in the greater Cleveland area. Now, now that I can do that during the daytime, I don't have to worry about have, you know going to work. I want to be in horror movies. Dress me up and kill me off. Hire me for one day, okay? Dress me up and kill me kill off. Me off. Yeah, and kill me off. He's available, people. I'm available, right? How do people get a hold of you? What's what would you say? What's your preferred is it email? Is there? Uh... Um, actually, I just ask people to text me, and because um, I'm I'm terrible about looking at my email, and right. and I really don't do Facebook and so forth. But I'm we should we should post my uh, my cell phone number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Up there, can you super that in at some point, Beth? So absolutely. people know what that yeah. is. And then absolutely, they, yeah. we'll do that. Yeah, and then they can just text me, which is fine, or call me. Or call. I'm fine he, with. He people. will talk. Oh, I. <laughs> have you noticed? I will talk. Okay. And this is, and, and if if you look at if you ever go and look at my essays that I've written out there, I put my full address out there. I put my full email address out there. I put my cell phone number out there. And of course, a number of people have said to me over the years, Jesus, Rex, aren't you afraid of people like spamming you in this? It's never yeah. happened. Yeah. It's never happened. Now, unfortunately, I don't get hardly any calls either that are legitimate calls. I'd love to get legitimate yeah. calls. Yeah. But I'm, I just have never found any de detrimental reason for, you know, not putting that stuff out there. Just the 973 is your... Yeah, 216-973-0050. Yeah. So Beth is putting Rex's cell number out there again. Mm -hmm. Text him, call him. Yeah, text me, call me. Yeah, so Rex, you have been doing this a long time. You've inspired a lot of us. Good. I'm glad to hear that. You belong mm -hmm. in the Guinness Book of World Records, I I think. We're going to work on that. Um, 
you've there's people not only all over the United States, but there's people in other countries that will look back and say, yeah, Rex worked for us, and and he gave us some pointers that that helped our shows, and and for that we're thankful. For anybody who shares this, we're going to be giving away a Midnight Syndicate CD. We've been talking about them; they're they're good friends of ours. Good friends. Uh, we'll give a CD away next week. Next. We think next week because I think next week is Christmas Eve, as a matter of fact. And so we're yes. we're taking a look at what next week will will look like. Um, so it'll probably not be on Christmas Eve. It'll probably be in a, in in a few weeks. But as you share out, we'll we'll draw a name mm-hmm. and give out a, a CD or so for for that. Um, for those of you who are out there, you guys are you guys know that this that rex is a legend and we thank you for spending your tuesday night with us rex thank you and we thank you all for being out there and and spending your tuesday nights with us as well john passed and i suggested having rex sign the cd that's being given well, away I'll be, ha- I'll be happy to. so that's a good idea thank yes, you john i will yep. be happy to do that yeah and, and we'll i think uh i think some of those cds even have you in the credits I think there's a Rex B. Hamilton in the credits of one of those CDs as well. So we'll take a look at that yeah. and we'll mm-hmm. we'll sign that. Uh, we'll have that signed. I and, and yeah, that and, might be right. And know? Paul Tylicky, who owns Royal Scare, which is a, a, yes. a, a here in the Yard Haunt, he says yes. you are more than welcome to come and act at Royal Scare yes. whenever you want to. That was a fun Yard Haunt. Joe show. Jensen says great show. Who does? Joe Jensen. Oh my Lord Almighty. Joe, we love you, dude. Where have you been? (laughs) We love you, man. And and we we spent some time with Joe back in the 90s out in Chicago and spent a lot of time uh, just kind of. What a fun guy. Yeah, Joe, we. uh, we're glad that you're a part of this community, oh. and we're going to interview you too sometimes. So don't think that you're uh, just going right. to be watching. We can't and wait to interview you for Tuesday at seven. And well, we give we Joe credit. Drag, we're going to drag him to Cleveland. Okay? Yeah, we're going to beat him up good, and then give him chocolate and, and lots and lots of beer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. We can do that. Anybody yeah. else out there with uh, with comments? We thank you all for for watching, being part of part of the community. Beth is kind of uh, looking through. If there's any questions, still put them out there because even if they if they mm-hmm. end up getting posted in a week or a month, we'll follow we up follow on that up. and we'll look at those those mm-hmm. responses out. Mm-hmm. Again, guys, have a great week. Rex, thank you uh, for spending time with us and sharing your journey for so many decades. You're very welcome. Yeah, and thank you all. Thank you, Beth, for, for filming. Thank you for sharing. And guys, have a Merry Christmas. Happy haunting. <laughs>